Vin, my old friend, to tell us how you restart the program. Okay, Johnny, uh, I'll be glad to do. Uh, first, I have to explain a little bit about my history because I came from a center in the middle of the Netherlands where I was a cardiothoracic surgeon, operated there for 16 years, starting into in 1996. And um, I was involved in the initiation of, uh, I have no disclosures, I was involved in the initiation of uh, a MIAC program over there back in 2003. And it was quite successful. It was a very simple setup, um, only with an oxygenator and a centrifugal pump, uh, even without a, a VBT. And we did almost 14,000 procedures after uh, last year, as you can see pointed out here. Um, I left in 2012, went to the academic center in Amsterdam. So I left far bef before, uh, seven years ago. And uh, my focus was by that time on another subject. I became an arrhythmia surgeon for minimally invasive. And uh, so my focus was for a long time not on uh, the subject of minimally invasive extracorporeal circulation. But recently I met uh, John Inchel, who is here opposite the table, um, who is a physiologist <laughs> and interested in microcirculation. And um, I thought there was uh, a lot of new uh, possibilities to, uh, res to do research on and uh, like to continue and be, um, yeah, I try to explain uh, what's my, what I see as my assignment for the coming, near coming future. So I moved to Amsterdam and uh, what I realized over there when I came to the center is that they stopped, they started a program, did 60 patients with a mini pump and stopped. So I was very curious why they stopped. But I think the most relevant things uh, arguments are that it was depending on only one surgeon between 12 others and uh, they didn't show any uh, clinical improvement or they missed it didn't re didn't record and they, they said there were some safety issues so I tried to find out further what what happened and uh, it turned out there, there never was a training uh, an organized training when they started and there was an issue with communication. And there was a surgeon who was doing this uh, when he was finished with the dishonest mode, we just pulled out the venous cannula without uh, communicating with the uh, perfusionist. So I think this is the wrong way to start. And it didn't go well also. <laughs> so why uh, changing? Why should I convince myself and my environment to, uh, to start a new project in the center where everybody thinks this is a disaster? So you have to be really sufficient persuasive or have enough data and have be enough convincing. So I'm in favor, to, in favor to be in the supervisory board of our Dutch national registration. And uh, we collected uh, data already from a long time ago and the, the, the data became a lot better over time. Look at these numbers, um, one back, uh, 150,000 uh, isolated coronary cases. Um, and I just heard Rob Baker from Adelaide say this, maybe there's something in uh, numbers and registries. So um, in the Netherlands we have uh, what we call a chart module, which we can open, surgeons can go into, uh, look into, and it's kind of uh, protected. So you have a certain level of uh, access. Uh, and um, you can make all kinds of combinations like these. So I, I clicked on the mini extracorporeal circuits and I found over 6,000, almost 7,000 uh, mini cases. And uh, in different, uh, these, what you see these colors are the differences in uh, Euro scores. And I thought maybe I can click further um, and look at uh, the number of restornotomies in the general um, collection of data from isolated coronary cases. So it was about 4% restornotomies. <laughs> so this was for bleeding and also for tamponades. And then I looked <coughs> for the number of uh, patients that had uh, restonotomy in the uh, mini cases. So it was only 2.2%. So it was only a, well, it was about half. So it was only a quick look. And when I looked at acute kidney injury, I saw in the, uh, the common uh, isolated uh, cases, cabbage cases, um, still 60,000 patients around a little bit more than 1% acute kidney injury. And when I looked at the mini SSA, it was only 0.8. So that's interesting differences. The same for transfusion rates. This is the numbers from only Amsterdam. 
Um, and what you see is red blood cells, uh, fresh plasma and platelet transfusions for urgent, elective and emergent cases. And only for when you see on the left here um, the elective cases, uh, one quarter of the patients in our situation for elective cabbage get red blood cells transfused. And when you look at the national data, it's only 5%. So that's a real difference here. And while I was in, uh, in Antonius Nieuwegein, we also did a, a retrospective study for transfusions and um, selected to do did, did case um, uh, propensity matching and found about 100 patients per series of minimal, uh, minimal extracorporeal circulation of pump and conventional. And we found also considerable differences in favor of um, transfusion rates. But it's also... Um, um, known differences which are significant also from other studies. So they are quite convincing and it could be a reason in itself to change because you, you make a, a big impact on resources. So this is my thesis that I defended and I did a study on uh, organ injury, um, randomizing of pump, mini pump and conventional pump uh, with patients for cabbage over the age of 70 and during the, um, the care chain I did uh, biomarker testing, organ specific biomarker testing and found out that the mini X corpus circulation was the best organ protective one. This is a, a picture from a manuscript from John Inse that he will probably show tomorrow. Um, the funny thing that when I came in Amsterdam there was a closed uh, program for mini ACCA and they did 60 patients and in twi 20 patients, no, in 10 patients, John Insta was able to do sublingual uh, microcirculation testing. And what you could see already in 10 patients is different when you compare it to um, conventional extracorporeal circulation is that you see that the hematocrit is better preserved and the blood viscosity is better preserved and the uh, the number of perfused vessels, which you can see in one uh, video screen, is better preserved in the mini extracorporeal circulation. Uh, John Isabel will probably s say more about this because there are many manuscripts out there, and I think in the near future we will perform many more manuscripts when we can start a new uh, mini circuit program. So for now, um, for us it's uh, important. We already know uh, that helps us to start a program with our guidelines. And, um, how are we going to do it? I think we have to choose between maybe two, two systems. The all-in-one where you can upgrade all the uh, grades to the fourth grade is a good idea. I, uh, last week I went to visit the Antonius Nieuwegein uh, where they have a system like that. Um, but for me, I, I have a picture in the next slide. Uh, it looked a, li a little bit difficult. When, when you present this picture to our perfusionists, they say, oh no, it's, it's easy to work with. But I think maybe for a perfusionist, a, the perfusionist that is a little bit conservative, it's best to have their own machine and um, they might be able to plug in a mini circuit as an extra so that they can uh, circulate with a mini system and do an easy conversion whenever necessary. So here is um, what I saw and I, to my idea there were too many lines in, uh, in a system that you can upgrade three or four times. Um, and that is maybe also prone for mistakes, putting the clam on the wrong line. But um, I have to think it over. Um, but again, uh, the nice thing of everything is that it's now um, a, a, an awareness created that it is a team effort. And we have every week a multidisciplinary meeting in which we discuss difficult patients. And when we invite the perfusionists to these meetings, we can make a, a patient custom-made perfusion plan and I think this is a great idea to do and it will inspire our surgeons to uh, to do this and to go forward from here so what are we going to do is to visit more centers and uh, set up a simulation scenario we have one OR that is completely uh, an environment for simulation we call it uh, OR 13 and we really don't have OR 13 for human uh, interventions so uh, we can set up a program and involve the whole team and even the whole care chain in, in, in the um, intensivists also in the anesthetists um, so that, that we create a kind of awareness 
Uh, as a matter of fact, last year we had a situation where we had about uh, four or five calamities after another in two weeks. And everybody came into the hospital uh, de <coughs> deciding about us whether we should close or not. <laughs> and that made us think again, we have to go start from the beginning and create a new awareness what is happening and start to learn to communicate with each other. And I think this is um, from the start a good thing to do. And we know now also with the guidelines and the, re the research that we did that we can do something good for our patients. So this is why we do it. And how are we going to do it? To do a thorough good training and involve everybody in the care chain. And what do we have in the end? A full practice of extracorporeal circulation innovation, significant outcome improvement, resource saving and cost benefit. Thank you for your attention. And, and I think maybe when we can uh, collect more data from other countries that also have good registries to combine these and, and have very big numbers of well-organized registries which, from which we can say something. Thank you. Uh, as I say, uh, Alex Wagba will be at the end, so we would go on with uh, Oz Sapira, who is uh, 